Okay. Oh, it, it doesn't say any. Oh, it because it said when you started recording, it said it. Okay. Yeah, I okay. Do that just in case something happens. Yeah, it's just a habit. I just, but, but yeah. <laughs> So whenever yeah, I, I I waited for this uh, announcement recording in progress, but okay. So yeah, guys, as you can see, James True is here, and uh, we already talked a little bit um, um, before we started recording here. And uh, yeah, welcome, James. Long time no see. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good to see you. Thanks for having me back. Appreciate it. Mm -hmm. It's been busy for both yeah. of us. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know what, uh, I was thinking this morning, that the situation when we talked last time is a little bit similar to the situation this time. Mm -hmm. It is an election year again in the United States. Um, when we talked uh, last time, that was shortly before the lockdowns, I guess a couple of weeks <clears throat> before that. Um, now, of course, um, the WHO has declared monkeypox uh, something of um, international um, concern. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we will see how much mileage they can get out of that. And um, so I thought, yeah, weird. Yeah, that we seem to be in these cycles, you know, <laughs> where yeah. the madness continues. Yeah. Yeah, I actually just just released like hit published before I came on an article called The Monkeypox Lobby. Mm -hmm. And it it explains that uh there's a world congress that that is formed. And I've I've put that because I'm in America, I've put that date as uh March 14th, 2020 through March 22nd, 2020. Uh our country was liquidated. Uh, seven trillion dollars of the COVID nineteen stimulus was basically uh, 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 liquidating the the former uh, bankrupt uh, country, and so uh, this is why the presidential seal was down for five press releases, and Donald Trump was wearing a hat that just said USA. He couldn't have the official seal because that would be fraud. And so the Federal uh, Emergency Management Act, FEMA, uh, has really is really running the continent of America now. And uh, what I touch on the article is that so America looks at government as three branches. Um, and, and so I'm just because I'm writing to Americans, I'm describing that there's actually five branches because there's a Department of Health and then there's a Department of Energy, of, of green energy. And so these these two separate arms are just simply uh, showing themselves that they've been here. It's just that people are slowly starting to to just see it. Um, America actually had to end all of their treaties with uh, Indian reservations during this time because they were legally not able to uh, conduct business like that. So even our DAPL protests, we had a, a a pipeline protest a long time ago that was that made federal news. And I really think that that was being uh, uh, orchestrated because it was distracting from the fact that all these Indian reservation treaties that we've had for 400 years have been revoked. But it that becomes silent news because it's not as exciting as, as the protesting itself. Uh, I Additionally, I just uh, showed how Macron uh, really has purposely uh, uh, doing a, a wonderful job at, at, at creating a car fire in the entire country and just kind of destroying it all. He he cut off the heads of of the statues in broad daylight. The the uh, all the fountains along the river of Paris have actually been emptied. Uh, of course, the cathedral burned, and no one's no one's really. We still don't know why that happened. Uh, this is the most sophisticated fire protection system that had ever been built in the world. It was $2 million every year with a staff of two people always on duty. Their whole job was to watch the forest above and make sure it didn't burn. And so um, to me, Corona is giving us the tools to just see the truth of how these things work. I think a lot of our own denialism and fear has really been at the heart of why we don't see it. I certainly don't don't mind us blaming them for deceiving us. That's fine. But I think if we really want to be productive, we actually see that a lot of this just takes place in broad daylight because they simply know that our denial really just keeps us out of the loop. It's really our 
our inability to accept uh, wh what government would have to look like to function. So uh, 2013, this World Health guy, the monkeypox guy, actually tried to push monkeypox and it failed. He didn't have enough votes. In fact, they were lobbying for a monkeypox as a world health epidemic. And he had to uh, come back and say, I'm sorry, monkeypox isn't a concern. And it's back this year because they have more votes. And this is what I put forward in my article that really you, this is just how the new Congress would work, because the only currency that we could have in the world would be health and energy. We can't have a uh, no one's going to agree to a centralized dollar, at least not right now. Well, it's getting there. But until then, why even work off fiat currency when we can just use health and energy? So I don't I don't want to keep going. I'm sorry, Julie. I tend to just just uh, just keep going and going, Judith. But but I, I just the article just came out and it's just it's really got me like, dudes, can we please see this? <laughs> because it's really obvious to me, uh, especially when when you remind me that we were in the same place not too long ago, all these would be necessary things to burn down all the statues being torn down in unison, all, all the just the politics just purposely uh, just being as awful as they can. It, it's it's very clearly steps of, of what's happening next. Mm. Uh, when you say the uh, treaties with the reservations have been revoked, what what exactly does that mean? I know, for instance, that the police in the reservations has no uh, jurisdiction. The the regular oh, yeah. So uh, for America, didn't really discover this place wasn't really discovered. It was just sort of erased, and so. Um, as you watch all of the uh, autonomous treaties with the Cherokee, the Iroquois, with just a lot of different ones, it, it, at least 50, have been condensed into centralized packs that the government has just tried to do its best to make good on, but also do what they want. And, and what happened crucially during that week of 314 was that Donald Trump actually told the Indian reservations that that we are not able to renew or to ratify or to change any of these treaties because the structure, the structure of these treaties has changed. And so in a way he was telling the truth as much as he can. And, and what I think really is happening is, is that it's more of a legal thing because it's like, look, if we were to renegotiate this treaty, it would, we would, we would have to be doing it under fraud. And in order to make this a world court that works, because keep in mind, they're, they're not writing the history for us. They're commissioning the history for the future. So in the future, it will look like uh, all of us autonomously, consensually uh, came out and agreed to shut down America. And we hired Donald Trump, the man who says you're fired to do it. So, so it's like all these are how you build the mythology. You know, it's that's why we call them the commission of truth. You, you commission a painting. You commission someone to to tell you a truth. These are these are the same thing, and they're crafted by artists, and those artists are bureaucrats, and we're just now seeing it. That's all. Mm -hmm. When you say to shut down America, um, what does that entail? So the shutting down America is almost all on paper. Uh, it's strictly just uh, you, you're looking at a petrodollar that really should have been shot in the head, you know, 100 years ago. Uh, but because because it just it, it, this isn't even unique. All business works this way. The stock market works this way. Hype is a very important uh, part of any of any corporation. It, it's a, an important part of you as a person. Your own immune system is a kind of hype. So. These things, it's fine to be angry and mad, but but if we want to understand just the natural state of government, this is a requirement for it to function. So you're looking at a belief engine, and that belief engine has people attached to the outside. And regardless of what the inside does, if people are trying to drink from the belief engine, they're just going to keep drinking uh, just blank air, basically. So this is something that's that's uh, been liquidated slowly over time, and, and and by liquidated, it's it's you're really looking at uh, people that 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 would find it kind of insulting if they had a social security number, people who who if they were in the system working with money, it would almost be beneath them because why would you play monopoly with 
with ape creatures if, if if you have your own currency and that currency is probably something much more divine in the sense of the rarity of nature would probably be something in that currency like a genetic kind of currency or a dna currency or of course precious metals would would be part of that but i think it's more about precious biology so when you start to look at that then you can kind of look at america again as sort of a stock the DNA stock that is inside of us is actually a commodity because we are the red heifer. Uh, America throughout ancient Mesoamerican history has this really strong history of always being a virgin that's ignorant and a foreign power, typically called Watiko, this essence of psychopathy comes in and plunders it. So to me, I, I see America as, as a a farming ground that's purposely kept ignorant over a long, long time to kind of follow the soil to allow virgin DNA to prop up. And then that that is used to uh, invigorate an economy, build a war, take over the entire world. This is all the the story of Quetzalcoatl, uh, Thalak and Huchlipotli were these gods that one worshiped the sacred fertility. So this is like the Democrats in abortion and the other worship the hummingbird of war and terrorism, which is the Republicans. So to me, the two party system is even showing you a, a centuries old pattern uh, of, of how we've, we've always, uh, when I say we, I mean, collectively the people that, that sort of run things. I, I think that we're part of them, even if we're just their stock, the fact is, is that we are part of that. So I hold us responsible. But but anyway, to say that America's purposely been been left in this ignorant state because this is just how you how you raise a world. These are people that probably have 50,000 years of history, 200,000 years of history documented somewhere in a book. So and, and that book is probably a machine. That machine's probably a computer. That computer probably has some pretty dope ass information that, that just shows them a much larger timeline. And that timeline is more about the soil itself is the product. So if you were to own the land and truly use its resources, human consciousness would be uh, really what you're growing. So I, I look at these things, I try and look at these things from that giant view, from that really far away view. And, and when I do, a lot of a lot of the actions you see on the ground seem to make a lot more sense to me from a farming uh, perspective, from a greenhouse perspective. Uh, and, and that kind of gets me through the day. It feels like I can see things that others can't. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, uh, talking about seeing uh, things that others can't or can't or do not want to comprehend. Um, do you sometimes have the impression you are walking through an open air asylum? Well, I, I so yes, however, however, I, I think that sanity itself is kind of an inflammation that mm -hmm. human consciousness right now, we are all homo sapien sapien. If you were to call us something scientific, you would say we are all homo sapien sapien and that all of us are a singular species because we fit in that category. And that from that category, what I see happening is that your name itself, my name is James Drew. And that that name, I imbue that name and become a new species. And that new species is writable by me, my transcription, my DNA transcription, everything I put into myself and in, in the terms of information or experiences, all my actions, the amount of times that I lie or that I speak, maybe even not lie. It's more because I'm trying to change the marketing on that word. But but the times when we are sarcastic or the times when we are not authentic with our true intentions, we we are cheapening our own product, our own species. So from my mind, it, it's whether or not anyone meant to do this, it seems to be that we've been put in a place where we are allowed to develop our own species. And that the moment we do that, we become something beyond. So I see that these countries' citizenship itself isn't a prison. It's not a 
form of like control. I see it more as a safety net inside a greenhouse where consciousness is just learning to grow. So the two poles of, of, of our society are here to teach really, really inkling like children, children of, of, of new, of new experience that just don't know. It trains them in a, in a landscape of mythology so that all of us can relate. So to me, the lies that we're told aren't really as important as the fact that we're watching all of us be placed into a similar language construct. And that language construct, I think, is doesn't actually imprison us. I think it liberates us more. The moment the internet was born, I became healthy. I became connected to people that fucking saw what I did. I, I became invigorated because I see a, a mycelium network that we call silicon and that that silicon is the most natural thing in the earth and that we've built a network all of it. But because people don't want to accept how natural or biological they are or how connected they are, we have to kind of dress it in this costume of technology and, and that way we can still fear it. So we can use it, but we can fear it. And it's it's sort of like a way of weaning ourselves uh, into the pool. So if we were just to drop and let go of the sides, uh, this would be what, what society calls insanity. So sanity would be holding the sides of the pool at all times and never letting go. And, and I think that, that sanity is important for people that are learning how to swim but that many of us, many of us have grown out of this very greenhouse that we're calling evil. And that the reason why we call it evil is because psychologically, that's how much we've grown. <laughs> we've grown so much that we see this evil system and want away from it. And that actually pushes us into insanity because insanity means we are internally sane. Insane means to be internally sane to feel that the sanity is a conglomeration of the self. So the ego would be your sanity bubble. But I'm calling it insane because the rest of society is going to call you insane because you've let go of the edge. Mm. I have thought for a long time that all these uh, little gadgets that we are using, like uh, cell phones, computers, um, is more or less a crutch for, you know, for the abilities that we have naturally, that we could connect um, telepathically, let's say, or, mm -hmm. or what you called interconnectedness. But for some stupid reason, um, we outsourced that into the realm of technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And and, and I, that's why I call it a crutch, because it would be the only way we could learn how to walk, you know, so we crawl and then we then we stand and then we walk and then we run. And these are highly complex things to a baby. And that we would imprison the baby in a cage where where the baby wouldn't fall down the stairs, where the baby couldn't go into the kitchen, where the baby's not going to get too close to the dog's food or the cat's litter box. And that eventually the baby, the only way we know that the baby, that what we did for the baby worked is the baby would start to be frustrated and angry and feel imprisoned by what was done to him. So, so to me, these feelings that we're having on a mass psychological level, the fact that there's so many more people into conspiracy theory, the fact that there's so many people that are that are angry, upset. I think it's it's one of the most healthiest signs of a greater work happening because growth would hurt. If you watch a plant grow in speed up photography, you can imagine that that's probably kind of hurts that they're, I mean, especially when a flower, holy shit, when a flower takes its genitals and unfolds them <laughs> in like this crazy way and sticks out its, its innermost parts into the, into the raw oxygen and just says, I'm here. That's got to sting. It's got to hurt. In fact, the hurts that we have in seeing the truth is directly proportional to how much we grow. But when you're living in a place that doesn't know how to uh, uh, alchemize pain, 
to understand that pain is information and it's telling you something, you're going to inflame and inflame is going to look like everyone's evil and they're trying to kill us. This would be the only way that you could inflame enough to protect yourself from this new world. In a lot of ways, I think Corona was much more uh, environmental, Judith. Like it's, I, I, I'm not saying this is right. I'm just saying this is how I picture it. It's like there's a lens. The sun is a lens and the diameter expanded during Corona. And that expansion turns us into 4K creatures that are now 8K. I've just used this as an analogy, but our ability to discern, we have so much more resolution now. And that I think that at the heart of all the people that had respirator problems that, that could not breathe, even the I can't breathe, even the people that have lost their smell are people that are trying to process an 8K signal through a 4K antenna. And that I, I know this sounds crazy, but I believe that the pandemic was actually capitalizing on a known astronomical event and was able to create a pandemic, this is going to sound insane, but to give people a way out, to give people that they knew were going to find this new resolution super painful, giving them a pandemic gives them a way out of the theater. It's a voluntary, consensual way to say, I can't handle this place anymore. It's brutal. It sounds horrible. It's, it's akin to how an orca might live in the ocean, but the orca has six more octaves of understanding than we do. It's able to listen to six times the resolutions of notes. So when we see orca do things that we call cruel or inhumane, we're actually looking at someone that's living in a signal that just has so much more bandwidth to it that it hurts us. It H-E-R-T-Z us. The pain hurts so this entire world of spiritual trauma is stretching your drum of consciousness, but it's only effective if you consent to this crucifixion. And I believe this is truly what's at the heart of all the angst and why we're unable to apply ourselves and create a kind of Lemuria. So we instead insist it's other people doing it to us because the truth is, is that we're inflamed from this change and we need someone else to help us out. If you're going to go to the government for help, this is what it's going to look like all the time. Even if you think government's great. I was in the Navy. They still treat you like fucking cattle. It's, it's not even about, oh, we, we think you're cattle. This is the best they can do because it's your job, not theirs. So all of this is just a grand uh, eye-opening and it's burning like a bitch, you know, like it burns to, to look at it directly. So, so most of us don't. Mm. When you said conspiracy theory recently, I heard somebody here in Germany say the difference between conspiracy theory and reality is about 14 days now. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Yeah. I also think that that if we would have more patience with the ones that call the word conspiracy allows someone who who is already inflamed by the fact that maybe government isn't real or, or that people lie to them. They're going to need that word conspiracy to just hold their shit together. If they can call you a conspiracy theorist, they feel better. And you and I actually want them to feel good. I have tried to rip open these people's eyes and I am I am only cruel for doing that. I am a I am a cruel evil person for insisting that I have to rip open this person's eyes and show this light to them because when I do I'm very surgical with my words. I am fucking just brutal behind a joust and I've I've done this. I've spent years doing this. I will pry open these fucking eyes and cram my flashlight into it. And I'm telling you, it, it has uh, very bad results because it actually makes this process harder. No one's going to be able to process trauma if they do not feel it was consensual, which is why when we watch people insisting that we're crazy or we have conspiracy theories, remember that this is a garden and that this is soil, and that these are little little plants that have just poked through. They are freaking out over the fact that there's light. They don't even know. They've never looked at light directly. They've never even felt the 
atmosphere because they've always been surrounded by the pumice of soil. So this tells me we're fucking doing great. Like overall, this place is a garden that's producing a really great crop. Is it pruned? Yes. Is it heirloomed? Yes. Do we know enough history to even judge it? I don't think so. Like I just, I don't think overall in the long term we can see that yet. That's why when I think about even what's happening now with the trans movement stuff, what, what it, when I look back, I see since 1950, in America at least, with the rise of Elvis Presley, there was a movement of wanting sexuality to not simply be about fertility. Mm-hmm. And that that movement of sexuality away from fertility uh, is actually something that happens in the plant kingdom. That it turns out there's a lot of plant life. Uh, kudzu is an example of this. Ivy is an example of this, I should say. When it finds enough proliferation, it will shut down certain parts of its fertility because it, it will choke itself out. So there's a rising of consciousness that's happening. The rising of consciousness turns our muladhara. This is the opposite of your crown chakra, you know, the very base chakra. It makes that muladhara no longer just sexual. That Muladhara gains in resolution and us firing, us being turned on is no longer necessarily tied directly into fertility. That we can be turned on because we have more energy, we have more plasma. So each of our chakras have these octaves where the lowest would be, I must have sex to survive. The outer would be, God, that song turns me on. The, The even outer would be, This person turns me on, but I'm not actually attracted to them physically, but they turn me on. What does that mean? And we start to process this feeling because before we only saw red and blue. And now because our resolution is higher, there are these shades of purple and they're making us feel insane because it's so completely different than when we were gripping our hands on the side of the pool. That's that's. Really, the aperture of consciousness is is going to have these side effects. It would be quite natural for us to feel this way because we're our diaphragm is expanding. So you don't think that uh, the trans movement is artificially induced? I think if it was artificially induced, it would have absolutely had to start in the forties, in nineteen forty and nineteen fifty, and that. Uh, it would be so kind of, uh, it's hard for me to imagine that they were thinking 80 years ahead and putting all their resources into trying to save our, like, why, create. Why, why would it have been in the 40s? I don't get it. Explain that to me. Um, because in the in the 40s, and so I can only talk about America. I, I've only lived in my soul. So so that's why that's the number one reason. <laughs> number two is because when I look at, at the societal changes, uh, the, the 20s uh, was, I think, much more about fertility. Um, that fertility started to transmute into prohibition. Uh, the invention of the cocktail, the, the rise of Hollywood it is, in my mind, the consciousness is saying, look, it, it's. Yeah, sex is great, but but there's something more. There's there's something more about this. And we created fame. This this fame actually, it's not that we created it, it's that fame grew into its own industry. The fact that fame could become its own industry, in my opinion, is a really big clue to this Muladhara chakra opening up, your base chakra, your sexuality gains resolution. And so you you start to understand. Uh, okay, perfect example is rape. People will sometimes mischaracterize rape as being something that's not about violence or power. So the rapist will will uh, create a sexual component because he doesn't see the difference between sex and power. Sex mm. feels good. Power feels good. They're the same color to him, Judith. These are the same color. It's not that he's he's trying to be confusing or, or suave he literally cannot he's colorblind he can't see the difference between red and green but he wants either one he wants he, he he wants that in fact the wanting of that really is the learning of the difference of that so even the punishment that a rapist goes through is widening his drum and he's being for or her drum <laughs> and they're being forced to to see the difference between these things 
So the same thing really is just happening in a more civilized way. Uh, and I believe that that the rise of Hollywood, especially after ending of the wars, the wars itself were sort of a a eugenics program uh, because we were like, look, sex, we're having too much sex. I'm just saying culturally, this is how the leaders felt. I, I'm not arguing either way because I wasn't around then. But to me, the World War, telling people we're going to go 15, 25 million people need to die because Archduke Ferdinand was shot is that that just doesn't make sense to me. Same with World War II. I think you're looking at a a uh, another event where consciousness has risen and that people are giving an opportunity to check out and inviting people to show up in a fucking field and shoot people for wearing the wrong color shirt is, I mean, you're kind of setting the bar pretty low for like what kind of human you, you want to keep. I realize this is so anti-military and I'm sorry, I'm from a military family, but to me, that's if I was trying to prune a society to have less violent people, I would just throw a fucking war. If they showed up to that war and they and they loved it and they had fun, I would probably do it again. And that if you do that twice, you've now eliminated like most of the genetic violence. Remember, I was telling you earlier about the commodity is the genetics itself. It's not that different countries are manufacturing different genetics. America is a country of war. So this thank you for your service is going to have to be ingrained into our beef. So the thinking of that is important. I believe Argentina is really going to come to the forefront because of all the genetics and cloning that they've been doing for so long. And I, th I think this will make a lot more sense as they start to come online with their product more. Their horses are already online now. It's sort of infiltrated the polo market. But I think that that once we start to find out that that family lines themselves are genetic products, then we start to see what I meant earlier about a homo sapien sapien is a kind of poultry. It's a kind of beef. But a person named James True uh, uh, is, is is it's a different species. And, and that this we're just seeing the rise between a lot of people don't want to be a person. A lot of people want to be a species. There is a strong benefit for living in slavery. And this is what people don't want to hear. But if you go back to, if you look at all history of every slave story we've ever heard, it, let's let's just take one, Caesar and the Rubicon. Caesar was fighting the Gauls and some of the most badass feral forest creatures you've ever seen. And when he, when he came back, one million of them followed him voluntarily as slaves. One million of them. And, and when we picture slavery, we've been tuned to hate slavery and, and, and we can still hate it. I want us to. But part of the reason why we hate it and we don't see it correctly is because we're ashamed of our own past. I believe that that breaking of consciousness uh, isn't necessarily always an act of brutality. That in Rome, half of that population was a slave culture because it was upwardly mobile. So I think we have actually, just like plants have parasites, just like beans climb corn, we actually need slavery to grow consciousness. And that the more disgusted we are by by elements of slavery is, is a healthy sign of how much we are grown away from that trellis. And so it becomes natural for us to start to demonize it and say that all the problems in the world are caused by <laughs> by this trellis that I used three decades ago <laughs> to get this far. And, and so these are toys and props that we use to kind of suffer our, our, our blistering in the sun, as it were. Because the closer we're getting to source, the hotter it is, the more we have to, to preserve our water supply, the more we have to really think clearly and stop making poor decisions because we're way the fuck up here now. We're sunflowers. We're flowers blooming. And we're yelling at each other for it the whole time. It's interesting that uh, you say that um, with uh, slavery and um, um, growing consciousness. I don't know if you have been following um, recently what is going on in Africa. Um I always have, because I was married to a Kenyan, I was in Africa many, many times. So um, I have a heart for Africa and I always have an eye out uh, what is going on in Africa. And um, I have to say the developments there um, 
are amazing right now. There's a strong sense uh, of the renewal for Pan-Africa, that Africa needs to work together. Um, we have these uh, three countries, Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso, who stepped out of the ECOWAS, that is an economic conglomerate of African states. And uh, because for their taste, it is um, undermined by uh, Westerners and their ideas and uh, what Africa has to be. Mm -hmm. um, they kicked out uh, all foreign troops. They, they built A's instead of uh, ECOWAS, um, the Alliance of Sahel States. Um, Burkina Faso now has uh, built a and launched a treasury deposit bank. All three countries have stopped exporting their uh, gold. Um, Burkina Faso has also built a refinery. And the long-term goal is to drop the CFS. I think the, the abbreviation is CFS. It's, it's their currency. But actually, the French Central Bank is in charge of that. And if they want to do anything, they always have to ask the French Central Bank for uh, permission. And um, so... And they want to back their new currency with gold. Mm. And that is why they are no longer exporting. They um, also, you know, Burkina Faso and all these countries, Mali, they had a lot and a lot of problems with uh, terrorism. Mm. Um, and uh, now they have... Um, managed that they managed to reopen 400 schools in Burkina Faso because of this and the situation and because it wasn't safe then the 400 schools should, were shut down and the, there is so much going on if if I go on you know the the show is over and so I will stop it here but if you're interested just type it in there are many many speeches from uh, Ibrahim Traore, who is uh, the interim president of uh, Burkina Faso and also of uh, Goita. Uh, Niger now is the fastest growing economy in Africa and the third fastest in the world, and nobody is talking about it. This is right up my alley. I, I just My last novel was set in Africa, yeah. and it, it deals with the genetic uh, market there and uh, specifically albino, uh, albinism. And Tanzania is is its own economy. Of, of course, the rhino horn is just sort of like a lower version of that, but like the selling of, of human hands and, and, and eyeballs is, is a, a pretty, pretty rich market. It's a different kind of currency there. And uh, I, I certainly not nearly as informed as you are, but I just want you to know none of what you just said is like out of my, I'm just like, yeah, tell me more because uh, I, I, I see uh, specifically over the long haul, every single like I, I know there's a push right now to say Africa is not the cradle of civilization. I mean, I get that we're supposed to say that now because we hate science and everyone who says it, but 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 also <laughs> in Botswana we really have found like the oldest DNA chains we possibly can have. And what, why I find it fascinating is, is that not only in Botswana, but also in Tanzania, we've had this emergence of massively, uh, massively genetically, uh, we'll say advanced. I mean, I, I do think it's advanced, but I'm just saying you wouldn't have to say it that way. It's almost like massively different uh, genetic lines coming out. And that part of the reason why we use that term homo sapiens sapien is because first the sapiens came out, but then literally just like 10,000 years later, the sapien of the sapiens came out. This, this what used to be a tumor, almost a an inserted uh, tumor that was almost added. You could almost argue it was added uh, artificially because it grew so fast. All the blood that was required to run this thing that we call the frontal lobe is, is truly stunning. It's a genetic anomaly. And that when we look at, at Africa, not just what I just told you about, but looking at albinism itself, 
how this deals with consciousness, uh, because I believe that melanin uh, is is used as an electrical buffer to absorb truth that has too much hurts. And so when I look to Africa, I think that uh, throughout the history, the known history that we have, some of the most important keys that have been necessary for us to widen our drum have specifically come from Africa. And even looking at the geography that the continent has a purposely built cradle of, of all this elevation that's so difficult to, to change that even the colonists that have tried to invade the country have only been able really to, to kind of infiltrate the shores simply because the geography itself is like, get the fuck out of here. So I to me, this is a huge blessing. Kemet itself, this land of the black is like not only esoterically important going forward but it is truly at the heart of where we go next so i, I am all about uh talking about africa <laughs> especially now because i i just think it's crucially important yeah yeah and uh you know that there are of course when when you look at uh western media it, it's all bad it's all bad all three countries have a military government yes it is true they have mm -hmm. Um, yet in Burkina Faso, um, it Ibrahim Toro wanted to step down because it was uh, they took over via a coup, kicked out uh, <laughs> all the foreigners, uh, the troops, and, and on and on, even diplomats. So, and um, <clears throat> then um, he launched project after project after project. Um, <clears throat> And then he said, yeah, okay, so now my time is over. In 24, we will hold elections. You know what happened? The people went out in the streets and protested. Mm -hmm. They said, no, you stay right where you are. And then the Western media said, yeah, he probably threatened them uh, yeah. uh, to protest. But there were people from Ghana, from other African countries who Ooh. came in to support that rally. How is he going to threaten somebody from Ghana? That yeah. That is nonsense. And I, uh, yeah. why did the people do that? Because for the first time they had tangible proof, you know, roads are being built. Yeah. Um, factories are being built. A tomato processing um, uh, factory has been built. Instead of equipping all his buddies with uh, expensive SUVs, mm -hmm. uh, he bought garbage trucks and tractors for agriculture en masse. He slashed the salary for the politicians, including himself. He, sl he slashed his own completely. Um, yeah, okay, he is still a captain in the military. Um, and he gets that salary, but he gets no salary as a president. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, th and that, of course, opens up the entire discussion because we have been told for so long that democracy is uh, the only good thing uh, a government can work. And now, Africans are saying, yeah, you know what, <clears throat> we ha have tried with democracy and somehow the West always managed to uh, install their puppets. We have suffered. We are going nowhere. We are not developing as, as countries. And uh, now we have somebody here as a leader uh, who is actually something doing for the people. So we don't give a shit about the system. If he is a, a, a military man, yeah, so be it. He's a good leader. End of story. Yeah, yeah. I uh, I think one of the biggest things that we lack is understanding that, that a central a posture to run a government changes as the people change too. And that democracy is actually a posture of being meek and 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 living for the majority. The scientism itself is actually the worship of collective witness. Uh, if, if I tell you something happens scientifically, you would have to call it an anecdote because you haven't you haven't experienced that yet. 
And so the personal experience is actually devoid underneath a democracy. So, uh, but because we have table manners, we're mostly ruled by table manners. Uh, and so we don't actually understand that a dictator is actually uh, a, a vibration that could be thoroughly necessary for everyone to have the best life. And that it would, it would, we have to trust each other to make our mistakes perfectly. And we don't. In fact, we, we tend to just uh, regulate our previous trauma into the, the into other cultures and, and say that we're fixing them or crusading them for it. So w- when I look at the brutality of Africa that we see, I think that this is just a shade of purple that you and I don't drink a lot. It, it, you can drive through Africa on a motorcycle. And as you're driving through, people are putting giant sticks in the road and they're hanging out with machine guns and they want to see if you stop. At no point do they actually shoot you or force you to stop. They are, they are waiting and intimidating you to see if you will. If you choose to stop, everything that is on your person belongs to them now. Your posture tells them that. So if Africa has people that 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 have this kind of I'm going to just call it weakness just so we can talk about this that has this kind of weakness in it the very people that are placing the sticks in the road and hanging out with the machine guns are telling them dude this is not going to work this is mother africa motherfucker you need to grow a spine and we can call that evil and we can eliminate all those people in Africa from the road and say, no, you, you have to let the cars through. And I'm, I'm, that's fine. We can do that. But you're watching the most natural, organic form of self-growth working itself naturally in the soil. It has such a loud sound to it that we call it terrorism, dictatorship, evil. And we end up Saddam Husseining everyone. And it turns out that Saddam Hussein, I'm not, I I don't even know because I don't live there, but I'm saying that in order for that country to survive, I'm thinking this is probably just what it took, that it took someone who, who had these kinds of of things. Netanyahu is a perfect example. It's naive of us to think that someone who's just normal could even survive being in charge of Israel. Well, like you would have to be really, really deeply, traumatically, epigenetically just turned and fucked up because the amount of cruelty that you would have to exude to keep your country together would require that of you. So to me, the countries themselves are almost like organs. They're like this pancreatic place that we call Vietnam and and this intestine that we call Chile or Brazil. And that really each of those have their own organic idea about here's what I need to survive. And and we can judge each other and say how fucked up the pancreas is or how the intestine is full of shit. And we'd be right. The intestine literally is full of shit. Right. And the heart totally bleeds too much. And the liver is just all it is is pissed all the time. Right. And we can we can assign these different things to all these organs. But truly, this is what what's required to work. So. I, that's why I think this trans movement is another lesson in, for people to start to see the shades of color of Africa, to start to see these deeper hues, because these deeper hues are going to be required for you to understand how the world truly works. This is a jungle. This is not a parking lot. This is a fucking jungle. We've been living in the jungle the whole time. Some of us have chopped down trees and built a circle and climbed inside and simply created an illusion that it's not. It's not. It's a fucking jungle. And so the people that are there, they're going to be predators. They're going to be black panthers. They're going to be <laughs> be killer sharks, right? They're going to be giant things that fly out of the sky and take you in the middle of the night. Why are we against that, really? What I mean is, is that we've been brought here, placed into this aquarium, and that the natural world's been telling us what it's going to take to survive the whole time. And at any point in time, any one of your ancestors could have simply said, I don't like it here. It's not enough. We can do that too right now. And we're given the exit ramp. We have all these opportunities to shut ourselves down and just to be like, ah, everything's fucked up. And that that would be you consenting, telling your DNA that I don't want to be here anymore. 
So even the people that are insisting that it has to be broken, it has to be fucked up, I think are actually just consensually telling the world, hey, I don't want to be here anymore. And that the world's going to help them. The world's going to be like, man, I will send a shark. I will send something. A macrophagy is what this is called in the body. I will send a, a, a living cell whose sole purpose is to kill you. And it will look like an ambulance. It will do that because you will feel calm if it looks like an ambulance. And if we take you to a place that that has the word hospitable in the title, you will feel better about the process of apoptosis. This is when the cell is purposely broken down so that every single piece can be given a proper respectful burial, like the Egyptian embalming, right? And so even when we watch people that are in angst, angst is good and important. But also angst is also a cry for help and that this cry for help that we're is really the exact thing we're supposed to be secreting. So I don't even think it's wrong. Mm. It's just yeah. hard to absorb. It's hard to swallow. This place is hard to swallow. And you know what? It should be. It's fucking nature. It's nature. There's a thing called a killer whale right now that, that just goes around the ocean. It, it's It's a giant black and white Hayoka clown with like 50,000 fucking teeth. It lives longer than you and I do. It's capable of going higher, of breathing more, of sensing God more. It has a deeper form of emotion than all of us, yet we insist that we are the pinnacle of existence. We are the pinnacle of existence because when we watch Orca, we think that that must be uh, unconscious because we see cruel. But we see cruel because we're looking at a color we cannot fucking fathom yet. We're looking at tones of kinds of music that are so diminished or augmented that it's throwing us off because we don't even know how to process it. Isn't that what Wi-Fi is doing? Isn't that what, what radio did? It's showing us how to see things that aren't there. It's showing us how to find tones and colors between notes that our ancestors never knew, right? The seven scales used to have seven notes now we have 12 and 13 we've gone from c major to chromatic so all of these things would look like horror because we're processing colors that quite frankly are, are new frontiers these are terrain we've never explored before and they're going to hurt until we learn how to normalize them basically mm. yeah the uh okra would not be there if it's you know if it's not needed Mm -hmm. it, it it fulfills a purpose. Yeah, it has a purpose. That's my little inside fish joke. But yeah, I, I think as we looked at our own predators in the world, and media typically will remove those from the screen so we don't even see them. I, I, I don't really know what exactly is happening in Somalia. I'll just give that as an example. I don't actually know what's happening there. I definitely think that there are dudes with guns. I mean, I've looked at the, I've studied the acidic, uh, so the acidic nature of the salt in Africa changes from the West Coast to the East and from the South to the North. And that Swahili, this sort of proto-language in Africa, uh, you can actually track <laughs> how the higher acidic content makes words more uh, cursing, more biting. So the language gets more fierce. And so as you follow the Horn of Africa, it's, it's dumping the most acidic parts of that. These, this is there. You can't even drink the water there because it, it has its own... Uh, electric charge to it and so you're just seeing that uh accented in the people and when you think about what somalia is it would actually be almost like the place that you would catch the drops from the rhinoceros's nose so so like the most potent uh uh acid out of africa is being dumped on that island and i think that because we cannot process those tones we just call it the most evil place in the world but we actually don't really know my guess is that it's probably just super intense there, meaning that it would have some of the most beautiful, amazing things that you could possibly know and some of the worst cruel things you could possibly know because nature tends to have that kind of arc to it. There's not a lot of, only only Hollywood and media says, everything that's evil is purely evil and it's never good. <laughs> and everything that's good is purely good and it's never evil. And, and we never ever see that in nature. I actually don't even think that we can even define what evil is, except for simply a lack of what everyone else would call good. Mm. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. I 
I remember there was uh, man, many years ago when I was still uh, practicing uh, Tibetan Buddhism, um, the question came up, you know, if, if you had the chance, let's say an individual that brings um, horror and uh, drama and suffering over large groups of people, Mm -hmm. and you know it would you um execute him mm -hmm. yes or no yeah or her whatever <clears throat> and um yeah it, it's an interesting um you know thought process if it's me who has to do that would, would i go that far mm -hmm. and um so The answer from the uh, Buddhist perspective was yes, but without uh, rage and without, um, you know, that 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 you take revenge. Mm. You know what I mean. Mm -hmm simply from the perspective of i'm doing what is best for most of the people hmm. yeah there's a ironically i use the moniker 5g because it hmm. fits but there's there's five gravities of love like five levels of love and you you, you know the first love is is more parasitic because it's You love the person that gives you milk. You love the person that that feeds you. You love the person that that wipes your bottom and keeps you warm. So you love because of all the gifts you receive from that love. So that's like 1G love. And then 2G love is uh, I love my sibling. Like I, I they don't I need them to survive, but but I, I love them because they're like me is, is really what it comes down to. And then there's love as a parent. So you're much more giving. You don't get a lot in return from that. So it's a it's a 3G love because it's you. You're the one that's putting out the amperage. But then there is love of humanity, which is you you love your siblings, but it's the siblings you don't even know. So you start to love the hypothetical version of you, which is kind of like an outer layer of love. You're 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 loving something even higher. And so then you, you would still be in the realm of everything that makes humans smile, I love, and everything that makes humans not smile, I hate. And all these are valid love, and, and we should live in, in whatever we are. But then there's fucking 5G love, which is fucking God love. And this is I, I this is a deep pearl. I, most of us, including me, are never going to be able to reach it. But this love is that I trust these people to make their mistakes perfectly. And that the moment that I step in and try and stop a mistake is the moment that I take away their autonomy and, and their perceived respect that I have for them. That the moment that I step in and, and, and fix this is the moment that I tell them a rumor that the world is broken and that they've been wronged and that they may grow vengeance. And that all of these things are more are worse. They may grow a sense of injustice, and that all these things are scars. This is a scar, and we disassociate ourselves from the outer world because we say the outer world is broken, but we are not. And that this cuts us off from 5G love. It cuts us off from 4G love. We enter into tribalism where we find others that have held the same trauma. This is what most truth truth movements are. Oh, you suffered the same lie I did. We 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 are brothers. And so I will identify with the suffering that we share. So you end up with an archetype where the people that are in charge are the ones that can show you they've suffered the most. And that this is love. It's a beautiful shade of love, but it's not a love that I can drink anymore. It's a love that is not going to make it in this, what I call Aquarius. I'm not saying that I call it, I'm just saying I refer to this as Aquarius. Anything post-corona, anything post-2020 is, is Aquarius in my mind. And that truly what we're, we can talk about pandemics all we want, but, but what I think is deeper is happening is the personal, psychological 
uh, reaction to being inside this new gate, to stepping mm. through this gauntlet. The Corona constellation is literally a gauntlet. And that a gauntlet is a, a Native American term. It's a lot of terms, but one of them is this Native American term where when another tribe takes you over, you have to run through their, their gauntlet. And the gauntlet is all their braves hitting you, throwing shit at you, spitting at you, and they're challenging you. And that when you make it through the gauntlet, if you make it through the gauntlet, because anyone might just decide we don't want you and, and kill you, who knows? Or you might suffer a blow that, that you can't recover from. But if you do make it through the gauntlet, that there's typically uh, the mother of the tribe is there and that she decides what happens to you based on your performance in the gauntlet. And that it is your performance in the gauntlet that determines the status that you have in the tribe. I mean, the status. This is an adoption process and that you would never be able to be told before the gauntlet, hey, man, we're going to adopt you based on how well your constitution and posture work. Like that would ruin the whole thing. It would ruin the entire thing. And so at no point in time can we know as we're crawling out of the cave. And God is not rewarding us for who gets out of the cave the fastest. I think he's rewarding us by who showed the most posture on their way out. Mm -hmm. What is the reaction to these things? Because this would ultimately, I think, be at the heart of what would keep us, make us an heirloom kind of species. Mm -hmm. God could say, James True recognized that orcas are actually uh, deities, that the seraphim, the ones that are closest to God, actually is a giant fucking cephalopod. It's a hermaphroditic squid whale that we've never seen. And that these are the creatures that, that receive closest to God because they, they are deepest in Sheol. They, they live the longest. They have the deepest octaves. They are the only ones that are directly able to perceive God. And so James recognized that. And he was really cool about this. He really sucked about that. He played with himself way too much. He had this drug or what, you know, whatever it is he wants to say. At the end of the day, how I held my posture, how how my antenna either grew crooked or grew straight through this gauntlet is ultimately the entire purpose of why we're here. This is the Egyptian set. I'm giving him my token. He is measuring my heart. Is it the same weight as a feather? If so, I get to choose. Do I come back? Do mm -hmm. I come back here and work more or have I learned from hell? Have I learned from the underworld? Cause the Egyptians say that's where we are. Have I learned from this underworld and, and is my faithful companion set the, the dogs that you see in the world are just this set creature that your best friend is waiting for you on the other side, but only when you are ready, only when you feel that this gauntlet has done everything it can do for you and that you're ready to get out. None of us are forced in here. We mm. tell ourselves we're forced here because it allows us to cry more. We get to whine more about our predicament if we can insist that we were thrown into this involuntarily. Mm. If you think about a, a karate class, when you're a child and you're brought to karate, what if your mom didn't tell you what was happening? You walk into the room, and everybody in their pajamas starts beating you up. They're <laughs> kicking you. They're 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 brutal. And that if you didn't know why you were there, the entire thing would look psychopathic. And and when they're trying to explain to you what a sensei is, because your mom didn't tell you that, you'd be like, I don't fucking believe you. I, I, I don't. You're insane. And the entire time, Mister Miyagi is telling you, get the fuck up. Get the fuck up. And you're like, stop hurting me. You're trying to kill me. Don't you? You're just trying to use me for my slave labor. So I'll wipe off your fence and all these other things. And the entire time is the reason why when God dropped you off here, he couldn't tell you is the same reason why the tribe mother doesn't do it at the gauntlet. The whole point is for you to enter this in amnesia because that would be the only way for you to test yourself, for you to see your own caliber, your own antenna. So... Mm -hmm. In my mind, this haunted house way that it feels to us is absolutely the biggest clue about what this place is all about. It, it would be absolutely necessary for us to have amnesia. If we were slaves, we would not have amnesia. We would wake up thinking that we've been slaves for 100,000 years and we would like it. 
none of us would complain because genetically it would be what we wanted to do, right? We're not that way. We're constantly ashamed of slavery. We're constantly insisting it's the worst thing possible. And that's a sign of people that just came out of that because they've done so well inside this greenhouse that everyone's freaking out about. It's a haunted greenhouse. That's fine. I don't mind us saying that. But that haunted nature really is what keeps you alive because you're just freaking out all the time. By the way, the body works the same way. There's a, Your neurons actually run a lot through gambling. I, I, I'll get us way off topic here, but... It really is true. Most of the <clears throat> propaganda that we see in the world is actually how your agency works. Your sense of agency, the way the brain gambles dopamine is very similar to, to our fiat currency system now. Mm. When you talked about the tribes, um, <clears throat> recently we saw huge, huge uh, protests in uh, Kenya and in Nigeria. Uh, Kenya, uh, predominantly the Gen Z generation and um yeah they were up in all cities and i remember 2006 seven no seven eight uh kenya held elections and um yeah like with every election there's always uh some riots uprisings but that one was particularly bad and usually what happened was that people ended up attacking each other because one was Kikuyu, the other was Lu, the next one was Luya, and, and, and what have you. And I was there during that time. And then when things calmed a little bit down, and I, I remember I um, was with Jack and his friends, and one evening uh, we started talking, and I said, you know what, guys, you have to overcome your fucking tribalism. It leads you nowhere that you are attacking each other. Mm -hmm. And now when the Gen Z's came out, <laughs> I was so happy. <laughs> they had their banners that said, partyless, tribeless. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I thought, wow, finally, finally. Yeah. The penny dropped. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That's growth. Don't you think that's growth? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yeah. So the the con, our history of being ruled by by kings and feeling uh righteous indignation at how poorly we were treated as serfs would is exactly the compost, the nutrients that we needed to raise up out of that and be where we are now. This is why so like you didn't ask me, but if like, if, if I was asked the same question as the Buddha, like, would you kill this person? I, I would have to answer by saying hypothetically, no, I, can, I would never be able to kill someone hypothetically because I do not believe that I would have to have a preordained algorithm over who I kill in my mind and go out in the world and do that. I, I, I don't think that that's mentally possible without us using our own psychopathy to either kill someone or, or not kill someone. I think instead it should work like this. If I was in a village and I saw a warlord and I felt that the warlord wasn't pollinating the people in a way that was constructive, then I would think that it would be my moral obligation as a part of nature to pollinate him too. If I'm unable to pollinate through a lower economic means, through my words or through letters or through you know uh, propaganda even, uh, it might be that I would need to physically do that. If I had the strength to do that, if I had the cruelty to do that, uh, uh, then that would be within my wheelhouse. But if I'm not, if I don't have the tones of murder, then that would not pollinate me or him because I would spend the rest of my life unable to process what I had done. So the moral answer is never universal. The moral answer is going to change. I'm about to sneeze, excuse me. <laughs> Sorry, the moral answer would change based on your your level where you're at. Mm. One of the things that's missing about patriotism is that if I killed the warlord, I think that what's really wrong with society is is that we have this idea that I should get off, that I should be free, that that I should I should get to good out of jail, and I should be a hero. 
and I should be given a contract and a corporate sponsorship and placed on on billboards everywhere. I think that's what's wrong with the world. Because truly, if I fit into nature, if I was to kill that guy, I would want to pay for that. If I didn't pay for that, then I wouldn't actually be a hero. I wouldn't actually be performing something moral. Instead, I'd be doing it because I was rewarded. And so then we wouldn't really know if I was truly helping the soil by pollinating it or if I was just doing it for all the rewards. The because reward is that not the entire village has to die. Well, I don't know if we even know that. Because if you start to look at things through 5G, then you might understand that the very tribalism that is being installed into this place might be absolutely necessary in 15 years when another corporation came in and tried to, you know, uh, install a utility in that area and kind of take over. I'm just saying you don't necessarily know. I don't have to know. If I choose to pollinate a warlord by taking him out, even if it's wrong... I need to lean in and say, this is what I naturally felt was the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. Even if it turns out that I, I killed uh, uh, Mother Teresa, although maybe we should have taken, I don't know, it's, she's got some weird history, but it's like, even if I felt that I should have, should have really, <laughs> even if, yeah, but even if I should have like ended someone that maybe turned out to be bad, I still would be obligated to follow my own personal morality. And so the, the wrongness or the rightness of that action should really have nothing at all to do with what my personal species felt was necessary. So it's, it's, I'm just saying it's a lot more complicated than we think. And why we tend to use the hypothetical to build policy, but that policy is always flawed because it's built from a hypothetical. Mm. Yeah, in in, in that uh, example, for me, it wasn't wouldn't be that complicated. If I knew that this particular warlord with his uh, acolytes, you know, wiped out uh, two entire villages in the area, I certainly wouldn't allow him to wipe out a third one. Mm -hmm. I would have no qualms about yeah. that. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Um, so if I was to find a warlord that was about to run over a baby and 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 he had just raped raped my sister and he had also just stolen all the money from my mom's bank account and he called me bad names and he was racist and a pedophile i mean it's like hypothetically yeah this is fucking great this is great we i can do this all day long like seriously i could do this all day long but it really doesn't come down to the actual source of what morality is in my mind, morality would actually be pushing against what the village wants because you're doing something that you still think is so important, it's so crucial that you're doing it outside of their their uh, congruence. And so to me, the true hero is typically typically going to be someone who never gets credit for it. And, and that that <clears throat> what's actually seen is is a much broader kind of shadow and 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 there's never going to be someone who's like placed on a statue or on a pedestal for that. The people that are placed on the pedestal tend to be more of the Perseus figure. Perseus was given golden shoes. He was given a helmet of invisibility so he wouldn't be accountable. He was given all the rewards before he even met Medusa. He had no idea what she had even done. And that to me, this is really what we think our heroes are. They're almost more of like fools that we place in front of ourselves so we can watch them behave and learn from it, but never talk about it. Most of the learning we do is more by smell. The uh, <clears throat> chemo signals of the truth, we can't block those out. So epigenetically, we tend to learn, I think, more than we have words to talk about. These lessons are, are really only built through, through high amperage vitriol mm. stress and strain under the under the tent of alchemy it's not about being tortured that doesn't that does nothing it's about finding strife but finding a way to stretch your drum to understand uh, a little bit more than you did before it doesn't mean to not interact or interact because that's, we're getting into hypotheticals right i'm supposed to pollinate the world you're supposed to pollinate the world 
And, and and I don't want to encourage anyone to pollinate it who doesn't have enough courage to do it naturally. This is just a much of a problem. So, you know, when we're insisting that people should be brave, I think that we're kind of being gaslighty when we're doing that. If someone's not brave, then why are we insisting that they be brave? Why are we encouraging them to be brave? Why not allow them to be their flower where they're at? Because if they rush in because you told them they should be brave, they get to blame you for the rest of their life. They get to to fully derailed themselves because they were encouraged by someone before they were ready. So the laissez-faire idea of, of not necessarily always uh, interacting really does, uh, has been personally for me, something that I've had to apply more attention to. And honestly, the truth movement's done that. I've been doing a lot of work on the antivirus thing lately, but honestly, the the figures that are at the head of this antivirus movement are so full of shit that it's harder for me to see through their bullshit and still find the truth about, about what contagion really means. When I see that, I might at first want to chop their heads off and expose them, but actually I've let them linger for years because I think that they imbue and inform everyone who blindly followed them as easily as the other people who blindly followed the uh, the government or the CDC. So to me, both sides are giving uh, anyone in the middle, anyone who isn't rigidly married to a certain faction of trauma, it gives us the ability for our flower to grow because we're able to compassionate all these different sides and not act because we understand we're learning more by not even getting involved. We're actually learning more by witnessing how this unfolds, but in a truly constructive way to witness. I don't mean to cheer for it. I mean to really look at it, 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 why people have these stances, what their posture is about, and, and where where the truth would have to lie. I, I personally look for the lie in the room because the lie tells me more about where the truth is than their story. You know. Yeah, yeah. The two uh, examples of that was um, you know Ukraine and then uh, Gaza. Pick a side. Pick a mm -hmm. side. You have to pick a side. Yeah, yeah Ukraine and especially. Yeah. To me, that was a, hey, let's find everyone in Ukraine who's crazy enough to want to do something and we'll just bring them outside and we'll just fucking take them out. It was like the easiest form of the Pied Piper. And this is something we just keep falling for, keep falling for, because a lot of us don't want to admit that we have a blind spot. Mm. And, and I think that this is part of why why all this vitriol is helping because it's it's really rooting a lot of us out because we're able to see, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Uh, there's a bigger creature on the ground. I, you know, you can't see it's, it's so big. You can't see it's, it stretches from horizon to horizon. It takes the meditation of a Buddhist to be able to calm down enough to actually look at this predator. That's how scary it is. Mm. And I think that's truly what, what most of us are suffering from. We can't see predator because it's too terrifying. Mm. Yeah. So in these two instances, I uh, wholeheartedly refuse to pick a side. Mm. Yeah. It, it feels to me almost like a ritual, yeah, as if you are obligated to uh, pick a side. Yeah. And if you do not pick that side, then there's something deeply wrong with you. Yeah. Yeah, and that really would be the only way that you could uh, separate the wheat from the chaff, from the chaff, meaning that which one of these people wants to keep being a homo sapien sapien and which people want to develop their own species. I, I, I think cosmology has a lot to do with this. The moment that that you stop embracing objective reality is the moment that you realize that what people call objective reality is really petrified belief of every single person that you've ever met, which includes their fears, their terrors, and that all those are conglomerated into a pace that we call objective reality. It's your job to build your own bubble, your own ego. This is why people shame the ego because you're building your immune system comes from the same place in your head that you lie. And that this is actually the, the heart of the ego. The ego is a lie, but, but all healing is a lie. So your ego is pretty cool. It's the lie of you telling yourself that the entire world is actually my cosmology. And that when you say that lie enough, your cosmology petrifies and it becomes as real as any other bubble. It's very much the story of Pinocchio 
uh, is has a lot more to us than we think. We are inanimate objects that are using our ego to imbue the world with enough feelings that it literally becomes real because ultimately what we perceive is all of reality anyway. So I, I think this is absolutely, everything's lining up perfectly for us entering into this new understanding. It's going to be bumpy as hell. There's going to be a lot of people uh, that are revolting, but those same people were revolting during the Spanish flu. Those same people were revolting during yellow fever. I'm just trying to say that I think a lot of these epidemics that we're seeing really have a lot more to do with this lens of consciousness that over time the we we are learning to observe more because the grow light is as you approach the grow light it's going to get brighter it's going to get more intense and we're going to react a lot stronger to it i think and, and we're doing it we're doing it perfectly mm. yeah james thank you so much for coming um yeah good to see you again yeah <laughs> and uh, i i hope uh, we will see you a little bit more <laughs> And uh, yeah, it was, I know you were uh, very busy and uh, there was a period where you didn't give any interviews and um, yeah, a lot of writing, a lot of research. Yep. Yeah, it was like four books ago. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, my last two books, uh, Arc of Baphomet and um, uh, Black Eye Club, really look at the genetics and how the brain works and Uh, understanding consciousness and how we we tend to just create the hallucination of what we see and how important icons and mythology are to decoding reality. There seems to be an oracle of mythology that's in the room that's always telling us the deeper truth and the more comfortable we are in our posture. All these truths come through and it's really beautiful. It's a beautiful time to be alive. I realize things are intense, but I just think it's the jungle, man. It's just what the jungle sounds like. It's an amazing time to be alive. It's yeah. wow. It, it's like a roller coaster, yes. Um, but on the other hand, you know, let's say what what we touched on uh, with Africa. There, there, there are a lot and a lot of things coming out and growing in terms of consciousness. It's just that we don't see it on the evening news. <laughs> yep, exactly. Could agree more. <laughs> yeah, so guys, that was it. Night flight for today with uh, the lovely James. Yeah, I wanted to say James Brown. <laughs> James True. <laughs> Not James Brown. <laughs> that is something somebody completely different so okay before i say anything else stupid um <laughs> hot tub. Uh, uh. Hot tub. Uh, uh. yeah i enjoy it always good to spend time with you thank you okay